On June 2, 2012, DGP, the Center for Design and Geopolitics, held its second annual conference. Entitled Designing Geopolitics II, it was held in the Black Box Theater of Cal IT2, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology in La Jolla, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. The panel is going to work a little bit differently on this one. Lev Manovich uh, will, uh, here at Cal IT2, has done enormous an enormous amount of very interesting work on data and data visualization will be the uh, the respondent for this panel. Lev asked to uh, to set up the discussion um, for the panel with uh, with with ten minutes uh, of, of slides that he's going to speak to. So Lev's going to speak to this as the setup, uh, and then we will we will open it up for for dis uh, for discussion at that point. So ten minutes with Lev. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. So I told the band to stop me after 10 minutes uh, because that's the only way I can be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd like to use my 10 minutes to kind of continue questioning some of our established wisdom, right? and established wisdom is normally never right, about what is data and how to work with big data. And particular commonplace idea which I want to question is that, well, you know, we, we collect lots of data, and when you do data mining, which is defined in textbooks as using kind of statistical and mathematical techniques right, with computers to look for patterns in big data. Well, it looks very convincing. I mean, I started myself working with large cultural data, and here is exam some examples from a work of my lab, like 80 just two doors from here, and uh, supported and established with the help of Kaleti 2 and uh, the vision of Larry, SMAR. I thought, okay, that's great. But uh, as they continue to work, I realized that we can do so many more other things with big data. And also, what, is this, what does it actually mean to look for patterns, right? Turns out, you know, it's not maybe the best definition. So I'm only going to show you three examples. Okay. So the first idea is that in science, right, just in a way with this data-driven science or experimental science, right, where the data was small, you have to c come up with a best theory to explain the data, right, your experiments. And this is supposedly, right, how science goes forward. So somebody has a theory, when there is more data, it doesn't fit theory, when somebody has another. But ultimately, if you say, you know what, I'm going to give you 10 models of how universe emerged, like people will laugh you out of the room. You have to give them the model, and you have to prove it's the best model. When we, when we do what I would call data-driven, data-driven cultural social criticism and theory, maybe our goal should be very different. Maybe our goal should, should be to provide as many mo models as possible right, to map phenomena, the world, the cultural history, in many ways, right, both to question that any particular map is the right one, but also to multiply different relationships we can find in these cultural and social artifacts. So to illustrate this, let's take yeah, every, like, yeah, these guys up to here, yeah, blow them up. Yeah, yeah keep going. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's, let's go, let's go, yeah, you can take, I think let's take, let's take this one. Yeah, and just go up. Yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going. So this is a project we're working with. This is actually done in, in my undergraduate classes, right, with students. So we collected uh, about 5,000 images of uh, Impressionist art, right, so Sisley, Pissarro, Renoir. And then right, we're creating these visualizations where these images are organized according to various visual characteristics, right, which are computationally Right, analyze image, when analyze images computationally, computer extracts these characteristics, and then you sort images in different ways. So the idea is that images which are, okay, can you zoom out a little bit? Yeah, and maybe go, let's say go here, go, yeah, let's keep going, keep, okay, up, 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 yeah, up, up more, uh, oh, more, up, <coughs> no, up, 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 yeah. up, 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 yeah, the, uh, more. Okay, and zoom in, yeah, okay, and, Okay, perfect. So, so the idea is that when you do these visualizations, you know, one of the goals is to try to organize images in such a way with images which are visually similar, 
are next to each other. But there are millions of ways, right, to define similarity. So in this case, for example, you can see how right, some of these landscapes, right, very light landscapes, actually in one place. And then let's say we go maybe to a different corner, maybe opposite corner visualizations, okay? So here we have always portraits, right, which have a kind of similar contrast. This is not completely correct yet. This is a work in progress. So now let's zoom out, right? Let's zoom out completely. So we have all four images. Okay, let's zoom out, yeah. So, so, so in one of these visualizations, we organize images, for example, only by color relationships. And now one uses both color and composition. And now one uses composition and texture. So what you get is you get the same set of 5,000 images, right, which are organized in a variety of different ways. So what you do is you find new groupings, which you maybe haven't thought about, but these groupings are different, right? And, and we can't say that one of these visualizations is the right one and ours are wrong. We're all right, because we give you these different maps of the data. So my second example would be, okay, let's zoom out, okay, uh, go, yeah, go down, all, all, down, all of them. Yeah. It's the first time we're doing it, right? So it's like, okay, so let's bring this one and this one. This one and this one, yeah. and, the po and one of points. Yeah, one of points. Yeah. So let's okay. So this is yeah. This is uh, to the right. Yeah, to the right. And then this is uh, zoom in. Okay, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. More, 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 and go and go up, 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 up. Okay. So this is you know all the visualization which some of you have seen. Uh, so this is part of our project to analyze a large, a large sample of manga, you know, manga Japanese, right, Korean, uh, Chinese comics. So we downloaded uh, one million manga pages. And once again, what we're doing is we're organizing these pages according to different relationships of similarity. So specifically, if we now go up, right, uh, so the vertical dimension codes, basically texture, no texture, right, detail, no detail, so images which were we saw before was one extreme, so very kind of low detail, very 2D. Even as you keep going up, keep going, keep going, keep going, you get more detail, right? Text, more texture, keep going, keep going. More, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't be shy, keep going. Okay, okay. and then on the, on, right, on the top of this cloud, you get the extreme, more, 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 more. Yeah, right? So now let's zoom out, let's zoom out, okay? So, zo okay, zoom out, yeah, zoom out so we get the whole image, yeah. Okay, no, bigger, please, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, um, so because the two uh, parameters, right, which we're using are correlated, right, you get this interesting kind of shape. And this illustrates a second idea, right? A second idea what you can do with big data. You can visualize the space of possibilities, right? Possibilities in terms of how we define our identities, how we dress, how we furnish our apartments, like what happened in 20th century music or 19th century art, what didn't happen, like, right? So, so basically every image which human being can create or see, right, will be located somewhere, right, inside the semicircle. Again, only according to two parameters, you know, which we do here. So this is the, the d low or high detail, and this is basically contrast. So, we can see, right, so this is the same data, but represent these points, because here you can better see density. So what you can see is that in one million manga pages, right, most of the kind of creative solutions, right, which we realized, lie here. Right? Okay. And then here, there is almost nothing. So you can ask a question, well, how come people didn't create manga, which would be more like this, and how come there is no manga which is more like this, right? So this both allows us to analyze the past and the present, but also it's a very practical tool for a cultural practitioner. Because if I would want to establish myself as a manga artist, I would start creating manga, which would basically use this style or this style, because I can see which parts of a cultural space haven't been filled up. So finally, we'll go to uh, one more image, and I will use it to illustrate a third idea. So the best thing about, one of the best things about big data is that it gives you certain insights, and then it allows you to look at small data in different ways. So, sorry, sorry, it's just the same, you know, the same image, but zoom in. Right? So one of the interesting things here 
is if you look at this vertical dimension, like you don't see any clusters, right? you don't see any boundaries. So this is just one. The realizations, of course, you know, it's, um, it's what I'm going to say is only relevant to this particular dimension, but we can say that in relation to this visual dimension, we can't really talk about style of manga, right? Because we have all these different variations. So if you want to divide this into different subsets and give them names, it becomes kind of meaningless. So after we look at this visualization, we say, okay, that's great. But certainly, if we look at individual manga series, we have distinct styles. Turns out, it's a completely wrong idea. Right? So it turns out, you know, when, whenever people write about the style of film director or the style of architect, you know, it's a kind of assumption, right, which is actually wrong. So uh, let's go get this one. That's the last one. Yeah, and make it bigger. Yeah, perfect. A little bit smaller. Okay, so this is a single, this is one of the shorter manga series, right? So it's only 800 pages. And you can see that it covers almost the same space, right? Okay. So we have pages like this, right? We have pages, no, 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 don't zoom in, sorry. We have pages like this, we have pages like that, we have pages like this. So I can't even make an argument that this particular manga series has a style, and I'm sure I can't make an argument this whole artist has a style. So this is one of the unexpected things which I learned, right? So maybe the most things about big data is that it gives you kind of new lenses, which when you can apply to small data, so it kind of changes how you look, how you see everything. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, so can, can maybe can I ask one like, you know, couple of questions and then go to or, or Great, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think um, kind of maybe one question which I want to ask, you know, and I hope it will kind of speak to both of you, is uh, so in your presentation, right, you said something which I personally agree 100%, right, with this another stereotype, right? which people use when we talk about big data, where well you go from data right, to information, to knowledge, and to wisdom. And as you pointed out, well, this is basically just taking the old idea of how science was done before, right? You have experiments, you know, your Copernicus, your Newton, your Galileo, your, your Einstein, you generate data, and then you basically fit a model, which is some s simple equation, and then you know how universe world, right? Well, I think, you know, as I hope my comments illustrated, in the world of, for example, cultural and social analysis, we have to go in the opposite way because we have this knowledge, right? You know, we talk about class and status and style and period, but we never actually look at the actual cultural data. So when you look at the actual cultural data, all these models become questioned. Um, so what I'm, what, what I'm wondering is that, um, if you can maybe like say more, you know, when, because you already said this, right? And also maybe, for example, how do you think this applies to scientific research and scientific publishing, right? So now there is this movement, right, for scientists not just to publish their articles, but to also make accessible their data sets, right? And in fact, NIH, you know, NSF, right, and NIH require you to even, right, make a plan. But is this idea, right, which is, as I can see, it is like foundation of modern science, right? But you go from lots of things to a few things, and then, uh, and then eventually you get to a single formula. I mean, do you think this idea is also something we have to revisit? What's kind of to both of you guys? Um, so, so one of the things that springs to mind when you ask those questions and and this kind of leads on from an earlier discussion around models, um, is the idea of a mythology. And here I'm using it in a kind of common sense sense, the sort of colloquial sense of mythology. I know there's this whole sort of cultural reference to mythology here. But I, but I want to think about the idea of a mythology as a model that can be prodded and that is constantly changing. And I'm thinking about 
um, you know, one of the, if you know, if you look at sort of a, the, a sort of so-called primitive society that gave rise to mythologies that were basically these m models for understanding the world, there was there was not necessarily this confusion between the model and the world. Like the model was the model, and the world was the world. And right. I feel like one of the one of the mistakes we're making now is to think that the model is the world. That mm -hmm. that when we create this thing that we're then testing, that we are actually testing what's out there. And of course. Mm -hmm. You know whether they are the same or not is almost an irrelevant question. It seems to me. Could you give and us one example? Well, you know when, um, and again, you know this is sort of sweeping generalization of a kind of colloquial understanding of a mythology. But you know there were, you know, in a, in another time there was this idea that you had a story about let's say gods affecting the weather and. Mm -hmm. And if suddenly the weather didn't do something that seemed to be causally related to something I did, then I could change the model slightly to start to bring in other causalities. And I could say, well, maybe it was because of this. And if I sort of say this, if, if, if I repeat these actions next year at the same time, is it going to causally affect this model that's some sort of representing the universe? Um, and so I, I, I guess the, the, the point I'm trying to, to make is that the mythology of science ignores the fact, uh, you know, contemporary science that is, ignores the fact that actually the, the, the model is simply a thing that we can test as opposed to a sort of rigid structure yeah. that's trying to attain some truth. Yeah. So, so the, I mean, the, the issue of, of data sharing is, is an interesting one. I, it's another potential Dust Bowl issue. Uh, I mean, there, there's a couple of pieces. One is that, that uh, I, it is acceptable, it has been up until the last year or so, to have your data sharing plan be that I don't plan to share my data. Mm. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, that... that, oh that I was always writing it, honestly, because I thought you have to write, but you will share it. Yeah, uh, well, they, they, they've just started uh, denying grants based on bad data sharing plans. Uh -huh. The first one happened this year. Um, the other is that it's... it's um, we've got essentially zero training in the in the credentialing process to become a scientist on how to make your data useful to a third party. And so, um, you know, if you don't correctly label and annotate, if you don't use standard names and terminologies, um, your data might as well be, you know, in, in Aramaic. Uh, in, in many cases, there's a famous, although I believe apocryphal story, of a warehouse full of photographic plates of the sky, uh, where the coordinates of the sky were not kept. So no one knows what the pictures of the stars are of, right? And it's, it's, it's I believe it's apocryphal, but it's a good story. So I, I think that, that if we push for sharing in the absence of understanding that the data actually come from a human context, even though they're digital, yeah. right? they come out of the context of an experiment and a time, and if they're not labeled right, then it'll be very difficult to make them useful, which is the point. Yeah. And so, the, the, and this gets into, you know, training, credentialing, gets into architectures and infrastructures that actually make the data useful to people that didn't generate them. And I think that is a far harder problem than we than we talk about very much. Yeah, actually, um, uh, I'm reminded I, I had a I had dinner with a friend who's a neurophysicist uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about this question of data, and because he of course generates lots of data in, in his experiments, and he said there's no way I'd ever use somebody else's data because the 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 the, 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 the stuff the, that I'm basically crafting, I'm generating, I know exactly, I can sort of feel it instinctively as a material. And were I to get something from, from someone else, it, without knowing really everything that I possibly, possibly could about the measurement process itself, it's just not useful to me. And so the idea that actually what's, what's more important is in a sense the kind of the, the context or the metadata of the data, um, uh, that's a sort of intriguing one to me. So maybe I can ask one more question. Yeah. Ben. Can I, can one more, yeah, exactly. So just one more question and it maybe, yeah. I, we can do like short answer. So just to continue, right, with a little bit more of this idea that we have to question this established, right, kind of workflow. You go from data to information to knowledge. Um, so one of the ways, I mean, I think a couple of ways, one of the ways in which it doesn't work at all in contemporary science and technology, right, so people do data mining. Right? So the computer learns, for example, how to classify things, right? or it learns different clusters in the data, but it doesn't give you a model. Right? So you come out, you know, you, what you get is this black box. So the black box can identify photographs which have faces, or black box can, for example, out, you know, very, very well 
differentiate between good, me good email and spam email, but in most cases, in many cases, there is no model. So what you get something which is very functional, something which is very operational, but you don't really get the traditional kind of theory of how, you know, how, of like how these things work. Okay. So, um, if any comments, maybe? Or maybe, maybe, you know, sorry, I kind of maybe answered my own question. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, maybe in relation, because you work more with science, so maybe, you know, if you have well, some. I mean, I, you know, I think I, I kind of, I, th I think I said in my, in my presentation that, that in, in effect, the, the thing that's interesting to me about a model is only when it's used to pose a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the hypothesis, make a decision. Um, and, and so that's, you know, the, um, you know, in, in, insofar as no hypothesis is made, there's no point in having a, a model, it seems to me, you know. Well, there's, and th the word, the way we use model is changing too. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, one of the systems that I'm trying to get at in the sciences is that we should be using, you know, algorithmic and machine learning approaches to help us generate hypotheses, right, in, in very mm -hmm. complex spaces. Um, and then we should be using other kinds of models to help us prioritize those hypotheses because we get, we're going to have a glut of hypotheses at that point. Um, and then there needs to be a feedback loop where you actually test and see whether it worked or not. And what we have in our own, in like clinic, in, in, in the drug discovery business, for example, which Larry alluded to, right, we have this this horrifying process where we throw $30 billion a year to create lots of papers about genes and, 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 and bodies. And then we have a pharmaceutical industry that replicates as much of that as they think is necessary and a very linearized process to get a drug out to the market, which relies on incredibly small sample sizes. And, and, the, and the only feedback loop we have in the end is are people dying? And only then do we take it off the market, even if it doesn't really work very well. And so, you know, the, the output of that system is that drugs work in approximately 60% of the people who take them, uh, and that's in the best case. Cancer drugs work, work one out of four times that they're given to people. And so, you know, it, it's not about models being good or bad. It's about them not being used in the right steps in the process for the right reasons. And, and, and we fetishize the models to a certain extent. And so they're humanly constructed. We need to understand their boundaries, their limitations, and we need to put them in the right context. They're not good or bad. They're just tools. And, and right now, we're not using those tools very effectively. We're using you know hammers when we need to use screwdrivers. We're using Leatherman multi-tools when we need power tools. We're just, we're just not using the, the systems right. But, but isn't the, 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 the problem with sort of turning the hypothesis creation into a kind of algorithmic process, doesn't the problem then become that either the hypotheses that emerge ba are based on the parameters that are chosen in the first place to analyze, which means that it's almost a self-determining hypothesis, if you see what I mean. Or on the other hand, you're faced with this idea that we've just got to put in absolutely everything. We've got to capture all that we can so that the machine can derive some kind of correlations or, or apparent causality. And and it just seems that that sort of that at least an exclusion, you know, to to look at that as the as the only process for creating the hypothesis, then means that you kind of lose that the the fundamental thing that I think engages people in sort of in their environment or whatever is that act of sort of posing those questions themselves and trying to answer them. So I'm not arguing for a replacement of that. I'm arguing for an augmentation of that. Uh, the the models absolutely give us are, are constrained by the parameters or you have to throw everything at them the problem is that right now we're not using either of those approaches at all mm -hmm. and so what I what I'm what I'm arguing for is is that we need basically all of the weapons we have deployed um, and the role of the individual in deriving a hypothesis that's one of the most joyful things that we can do it's actually an artistic moment so that I'm not arguing that we sort of turn that over to the machines um, I'm arguing that we have large enough sample sizes that we can also have machines um, and especially in some, something like health where we're dealing with such complex interactions on such complicated scales, it's very hard for people to have hypotheses about genomic things because we just can't hold all the parameters in our head. Uh, but it's very possible for people to have observational hypotheses. Right? So HPV, the, the, the virus that causes the vast majority of cervical cancer uh, in the world and other cancers, right? That was, that was figured out by someone who noticed that a guy whose first wife died of cervical cancer, his second wife died of cervical cancer too. And that observation led to the idea that maybe he's the problem, yeah. right? And so we don't want to eliminate that 
in, in the pursuit of genomic data, but we also want to make sure that as we use the genomic data right, that we use the tools we have. So let's open to the floor. So both of your talks really struck me that um, there is going to be major disruption and disintermediation as a result of this commons that you both had different examples of, the things, measurement of things uh, um, just exploding and the commons that you've been creating. You know, as a, I mean, I'm an old person, but I can remember when there were tower record stores. And if you'd said to me that somebody was going to come up with this file sharing thing and, and, and it was like going to blow up all the tower record stores and they wouldn't exist anymore, I'd say you're completely nuts. And the fact that that was going to happen in a few years and that Steve Jobs, who used to make computers, is going to realize there's an opportunity and make something called iTunes and iPods and completely revolutionize the distribution of music and that all took place in a few years. Well, the kind of stuff you guys are doing is going to have similar impacts. So I question to you is who is line, who's, who's the deer in the headlights? Who's the first, over the next, say, five years, institution to get disrupted uh, by the kind of, because uh, the growth rate that you've got, you know, with the data, and, the, and, the, and like you're mentioning, will soon be a billion Creative Commons photographs. I mean, what, what's going to get destroyed first? Well, the, I think the scientific publishing industry is, is, is probably the most ripe for disruption. Um, I'm running a petition to try to get the, the, the White House to extend a, a public access policy to all $60, million, uh, sorry, $60 billion for the federal research. I think that's, I don't know if it's going to get destroyed, but it's going to get changed. Um, and then in the cultural space, I think photography is, is, a, is a tough space. Uh, I think doctors are the deers in the headlights for the most part, though, because if you're a doctor and your patient suddenly walks in with 55 pages of papers they've printed out and their genotype and medical records they've ordered off the internet, I mean, doctors haven't been trained for that. And it takes 10 to 15 years to become a doctor. So the doctors that understand these systems are 10 to 15 years away from practice. And so I think that's going to be the most painful division point in the world that I live in. Um, I don't necessarily try and predict in five years, but just an observation of what I see now. Um, it's very interesting that, to me, that people don't know they don't own their data. And especially seeing, you know, even products that are coming out now built on Patch Bay, um, people assume that they own their own data. And, and certainly within our own terms of service, we, to the extent as uh, that we can, we say you and your data, you know, we're not claiming ownership of that. In fact, I was reminding John that we had had a conversation about a year or so ago about how to apply uh, the CC0 license to that data, which is a process that's going on. Um, but so, so what, what I'm interested in is actually this idea that over the next five years, I think increasingly people are going to be suddenly waking up and saying, hold on a second, that, that smart meter, that Fitbit, that, you know, that Nike Plus gadget, that you know, the, 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 the water pump. How come that's not my data? And, you know, specifically because the marginal cost of reproducing it so that at least I can do something with it is so negligible that it should just be accessible to me. Um, why can't I? Uh, where uh, I was actually describing this to you earlier. We, we have this event coming up in mid-June in London called the Open Internet of Things Assembly where we're, what started about a year and a half ago as the Internet of Things Bill of Rights has kind of morphed into something a little bit more, um, a little less naive perhaps, um, where we're trying to discuss and hopefully ratify a document that somehow outlines some of these principles, namely the, 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 the idea that people should have ownership and or access to data that's generated by them. Now this is sometimes, lo the, and this is where it gets interesting, it's logically conflicting where you're my neighbor and you've got some sensor in your garden that happens to pick up something that I do, how do you deal with that situation? And even more uh, uh, interestingly for me, um, when you've got sensors out in public space that are picking up our activity that are, you know, based on collective actions, again, you know, how can I claim ownership of that? But on the other hand, why shouldn't I be able to claim ownership of something that isn't really a sort of, you know, that's a sort of fungible, unlimited resource? Um, and so all of these kinds of things we're going to be trying to uh, so before taking the next question, I just want to add a little footnote uh, to what you said. So, I so one of the reasons or, you know, why uh, 
and the science publishing industry really has to go is most of you guys in humanities and culture so maybe typically you don't look for like science articles so if you go look for a particular science article right you know immediately what you get in google search it will lead you to one of the science publishing website which will so yeah you can buy this article and i mean i only look in articles like in particular areas of computer science i don't know how it applies to other areas so typical price is between 20 and 40 dollars for one article now in reality at least in america right research universities such as csd like we have a kind of campus subscription so with, when you're on campus you can get it for free but you know if i'm sitting in some place you know in, in, uh, in africa or in uh, south america like, right my probably my university doesn't have a subscriptions so it's just completely out of control um, next it question I can I ask? <laughs> um, so this is, so as an educator of artists and designers, um, there's, I have a really kind of general question that ties together all of these things. Um, recently, one of the writing instructors at our college had given incoming freshmen the assignment, freshman students the assignment to um, observe a photograph or painting in the student gallery and write an interpretative, interpretive analysis of it, right? And what was really surprising to her was that not a single one of the students would mention the medium or whether or not it was, uh, you know, whether it was a photograph or a painting, how big or small it was, if it was on the wall, was it lit well, anything, nothing like that. All they'd talk about was the subject matter of the image which we drew as being from them seeing images circulating across environments yeah. constantly, and it's really what the picture is of and not what it's, where it was made or um, how it's installed or anything like that. Um, and so that makes me think about the kind of disruption to um, the cultural categories that we use for analyzing and, and thinking about visual culture that, you know, Lev, that you'd mentioned, um, but also this issue of, um, ways in which we see the world um, and interpret it, the kind of interfaces to the world or to art or culture impact our understanding of those things. And I'm just really uh, curious about the take that you guys have on um, how we prepare young people to be critical, educated um, users of all of these various tools or thinking about what is of value in the world, what is measurable, what is nameable, categorizable, and all of that, and how, our, um, how, we, situ how we orient those students to participate in that world. <laughs> I lose sleep at night over it every um. hour. Now, I have, I have a one-year-old, so I, I think about this a lot, too. You know, what's, what's he going to see um, when, when he hits it? Uh, you know, the, the good news is that these are markets that are vastly perverted by government purchasing. And that means that they can be changed far more quickly and unilaterally than other kinds of markets. So the Obama administration put in place a year ago a policy that's um, it's $2 billion over five years to create online learning materials under the most liberal Creative Commons license. So you're going to have, you know, and it's all at the community college level, but because it's bi-licensed, it means that it can be scaled up to university, down to secondary, primary, even elementary schools. And that's going to create, I mean, that's going to that's going to really screw up the textbook industry. And it's going to create opportunities for teachers to come up with pedagogies that are really interesting. And so you can imagine benefits of social stuff that aren't just about trying to sell you ads, but saying, would you like to follow this teacher who's using the following ways to teach their kids to navigate this sort of information? Because that teacher pulled in the same five pieces of content that you did, right? There are suddenly some really powerful and good ways to use this to do things other than sell ads to people that emerge from those sorts of unilateral choices that governments can make, right? Texas and California ratifying open textbooks Right, and saying we're not going to buy any more textbooks about you know, in printed form about Northern Africa and history that we don't have the right to change if there should be a set of revolutions. Right? Everyone does what Texas and California do because their school systems are the largest. And so uh, mm. if the, in science and education, the, the role of government is so powerful 
that a, a unilateral change can actually radically change the system very quickly in a way that it can't in the consumer world. So that's where my hope comes from, is that, that these massive investments are being made. Um, and these massive changes are happening already in the educational space. They're just not being talked about outside of a set of small, obscure mailing lists. But the reality is that revolutions often start in the last 25 years on small, obscure mailing lists. And that's something that, that, that I know Larry knows. Yeah. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, so thank you so much for these presentations. It's been it's really interesting. That was when I the what you're talking about models um, sort of really aligns with something I've been thinking about. And as the OptiWall was zooming in and out, and I became physically ill as a result, I actually had a physical reaction to it. Um, it was sort of raised an issue about control in my head. And what you were saying about um, the sort of the model and the the quest for so much big data. Um, being obsessed with this homogeneity of the data, I think, is really is an issue of control. And I get a sense that the model and uh, the model and reality are the things that are flip flopping. That suddenly, the data itself is becoming the reality. And and it sort of resonates with what was said earlier this morning about the Beijing Genomics Institute. And my own colleagues in synthetic biology talk about this kind of massive amounts of data they're collecting, but no one knows what to do with it. There is no sense of how to order this data, and that we're becoming obsessed with collecting it. And a way that takes over. And I w it reminded me, I'm doing a project at the moment about creating a model of the whole world. And we were really inspired by the Borges story of the map of the whole world, that the map takes over. But I wonder if it's actually going the other way, the that the data is becoming so big that it's going to define our reality and that we become the model. And I was wondering if that's um, just because I felt physically ill from the opti wall, <laughs> or if it is the control is, is becoming the data itself. I don't know if that. Well, so. Um, Partly in answer to that, and also partly in answer to the previous question, not that I have any good ideas about education. Um, one of the things that, that I think I've realized, and this is kind of just in the last six months, and it's ironic given how much work I think I've done on trying to build participative systems and projects, is that I actually don't believe in consensus. Um, I don't believe that it's a useful goal. I think that if anything, the idea of trying to structure systems that are maintainable even without consensus um, actually are more interesting and perhaps more sustainable. And you know, when you have that kind of system, then I think that the notion of a controller doing the control, as opposed to, let's say, goals being um, being set or defined, um, you know, you have this sort of transition where where control al almost means nothing. Um, and you know, I'm I'm reminded, you know, sp specifically of you know there are there are open source licenses, and there there are quite a few licenses to do with openness that actually exclude North Korea and Libya and what have you. And it's almost as though you know we'll collaborate with you, but only people we're already friends with. And and these things to me seem seem to be which are very much about this idea of trying to control. Um, uh, and so I'll it's like all U.S. government licenses. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think partly in answer to that, and partly in answer to like, you know, how, wh what I would want to sort of pass on to a generation of students is this idea of collaborating with collaborators. In other words, collaborating with people you don't actually agree with. So um, we should close, but can I, can I uh, say something for like 10 seconds? 12. 12 seconds. Yeah, I just want to maybe add something to your question about education. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to figure out how do you teach data mining to art and design students? And, and uh, some, some of the best visualizations in this display were actually done by students in our 10-week you know, long classes, and that's why we work with images. And I see also you know, discussions on mailing lists, but also mainstream press in the last year that about you know, everybody has to learn programming, right? Which is, of course, in the media we talked about 15 years ago. You know, and there are also a project to democratize data science. But if, you know, if people use statistics and 99% of them misuse it, you just wait to see what will happen, right? So that's a very big problem, which we also all, all have to work on. Thank you so much. Okay, and, um, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you.